Edward Said is a Palestinian exile. He's also professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University in New York. In his books, Orientalism, Beginnings, and The World, the Text, and the Critic, he's always been concerned to link the study of literature with the study of history and politics. Said's new work, Culture and Imperialism, was ten years in the writing. It's his most comprehensive exploration yet of the relationship between the West and the non-Western world. In tonight's arena, Edward Said takes a journey into the realms of empire, ideas and imagination to explain how he wrote his book. When you read a brilliantly elegant and ironic novel by Jane Austen, do you think of colonial slavery? Or when you read a brooding existential narrative by Albert Camus, do you think of the atrocities of the Algerian War of Independence? Or when you watch images of the Gulf War and see the technological superiority of the American Army and Air Force, do you think of the European Orientalists? I think you should. The great works of modern Western culture do not transcend the fact of empire. In fact, European culture shaped the imperial dynamic, but few people think of it that way. Show me the Zulu Tolstoy. What about the Bantu Proust? Was there ever a Haitian or Jamaican Mozart? The arrogance, the contempt in these statements runs through the language of people who claim to be speaking for the West and for what the West did. So, as Franz Fanon says, when a native hears a speech about Western culture, he pulls out his knife, or at least he makes sure that it is within reach. The West, the East, the Orient, the Occident, the European mind, the African mind, the Asian spirit, the Japanese mind, Islam, Christianity. There's some truth to those labels, but most of them are ideological fictions, they're constructs, they're fictional identities. They are the weapons of cultural war. I wrote Culture and Imperialism here in New York, but the book has its roots in a very different world. I was born in Jerusalem to a Palestinian Arab family and came to the United States about 40 years ago. My wife, Mariam, is also Arab. She was born in Beirut, Lebanon. We've been living in New York for 23 years, and this is where we raised our family. Our children, Najla and Wadiya, were born, grew up, and went to school here as Americans. Even though they heard a new Arabic at home and visited the Arab world, their history contrasts strikingly with mine. The Italian critic Antonio Gramsci once said that to have a critical consciousness, you must first have a sense of what you really are historically, although your history is a result of a huge jumble of traces left inside you. Then I think what you have to do is to convert these traces into a narrative. Ever since I can remember, I have felt that I belong to more than one world without being completely of one or the other. My parents gave me an English education in Palestine and Egypt. And as a family, we lived a strangely hybrid, part Arab, part Western life. My father was always there with his eight millimeter camera, carefully preserving the ceremonies of growing up. In many ways, it was a privileged and comfortable existence.
I was 12 years old in 1947 when we left Palestine for the last time. Egypt was our home until I came to America. But the experience of exile is not something I consider necessarily sad or deprived. On the contrary, exile can mean you see things with more than one pair of eyes. But a personal story can only be a beginning. The task I had set myself was more general. I wanted to understand, analyze, and then write the cultural history of those millions of people who had grown up within the great empires, but who had also struggled to free themselves. The conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. What redeems it is the idea only, an idea at the back of it. Not a sentimental pretense, but an idea, and an unselfish belief in the idea, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. In 1924, the British flocked in their thousands to Wembley Stadium to bow down before the altar of empire. Here in northwest London, the idea of empire found its expression in pomp and pageantry. But it wasn't only in displays and processions that the empire revealed itself to the Europeans who served it and the natives who were ruled by it. The enterprise of empire depends on the idea of having an empire. And I think that idea was best expressed in narrative in stories of exploration and discovery, in novels of manners and minds, in accounts of savage people and strange customs. My method was to focus as much as possible on individual works, to read them first as great products of the creative or interpretive imagination, and then to show them as part of the relationship between culture and empire. I decided to limit my study to the British, French, and American empires. Britain was in an imperial class by itself, though France was never far behind. America began as an empire during the 19th century, but it wasn't until after the Second World War that it came into its own. These three empires are the ones in whose orbits I was born, grew up, and now live. But as a native from the Arab world, I am someone who also belongs to the other side.
I first read Robinson Crusoe about 45 years ago. Uh, I was probably 11 or 12 years old at the time. And I was living in Egypt, which was a part of the British Empire. And I remember the book itself, I mean, the, the object, with tremendous clarity because of the wonderful pictures in it uh, of Robinson with his uh, suit of skins and his goat and his umbrella and his parrot wandering about the island. And I very much identified with Robinson, although I wasn't uh, English. And retrospectively, I think, I should have probably identified with Friday, the, the native, uh, who is brought into service by, uh, by Robinson Crusoe. But, but what impressed me about it was the intrepid, uh, incredibly resourceful uh, uh, exploits of uh, Robinson, but what also Robinson's gradual consciousness of his own um, mastery. At, at the beginning of the novel, and really throughout the first half, he's, he's very much afflicted with a sense of remorse because of all of his difficulties. He didn't follow his, uh, his father's advice. He wandered off. He was sold into slavery. He went to South America. He got caught in various storms and so on and so forth. And then he was shipwrecked on this desert island. And of course, he's always aware of those misfortunes. But the, but the crucial turning point in the novel is when he realizes that he has it pretty good. He's, he's turned the place into a, into a domesticated fiefdom of his own, and he runs it. And he is the lord and master of all he surveys. And there's one moment when he stands overlooking a veil, which is quite pretty on part of, the, of his island uh, in the deserts of the, of the South Atlantic, somewhere in the Caribbean. And he says the following. I descended a little on the side of that delicious veil, surveying it with a secret kind of pleasure, though mixed with my own afflicting thoughts, to think that this was all my own, that I was king and lord of all this country indefeasibly and had a right of possession. And if I could convey it, I might have it an inheritance as completely as any lord of a manor in England. And of course, the sense you get is that this is not just a possession for him, but it's also a system. It's a working economy, which he runs. And in this respect, it is really the first great, in my opinion, imperial narrative of the modern period, well before the official age of empire begins in the 1870s. This is a novel of the early 18th century, but it conveys that sense of the distant territory ruled, conquered, made profitable, made, as in Robinson's case, made the Englishman's own. The creation of the great Western empires was basically about the control of territory, actual contests over land and the land's people. Throughout the 19th century, the European powers were hard at work exploring, surveying, studying, and of course ruling the territories under their jurisdictions. Hand in hand with this expansion went the enslavement and dehumanization of the native.
By the turn of the century, the railways had been built, the roads laid, and the idea of empire had become a physical reality. It is an astonishing fact that in 1918, the West held a grand total of roughly 85% of the Earth as colonies, protectorates, dominions, and commonwealths. And this process was not just about soldiers and cannons, plantations and railroads, but also about ideas, forms, images, and imaginings. Representations of what lay beyond the metropolitan boundaries came to confirm Western power, and central to them is the notion that Europeans should rule, non-Europeans be ruled. Stories about the imperial possessions and their peoples were routinely told by Westerners, but it was only in the 20th century that the notion of history, as narrated by the colonized, took hold. And rarely was it done with such power as in Robert Hughes's The Fatal Shore. I see Hughes's story of Australia as a penal colony in many ways as a challenge to the old imperial narratives in which the native was always silent. I mean, one of the things that struck me when I was working on Fatal Shore yeah. was that uh, there just wasn't very much writing by Australians about the experience of the convicts in Australia. Yes. It was written and by others. It was, it was written by others and not even very much of that. You see, the, the, right. the, the, this is the reason why we were ashamed of our own history, because, yeah. uh, you see, Australia certainly does not display that, you know, uh, grand progression of Plantagenets and noble battles and one thing or another, right. you know, and the heroic right. situations that yes. the English history, which we were taught as, uh, my generation was taught as school children did, you know, I mean, Australian history is very much a history of, you know, failures and, uh, you know, and abortions and, uh, you know, and dashed hopes right. and one thing or right. another. But above all, it's conducted under the imperial sign. And so right. consequently, uh, the, the, uh, it was seen as a kind of, rather primitive, not particularly glorious or interesting coda to real history which was enacted yes. by the British. Yes. And, and, and was taking place elsewhere. And which was taking place right. elsewhere. Right. And so the, the, and you see, this was redoubled for us. Right. I mean, I dare say that's a general kind of colonial situation. Right. But it was redoubled for us by the circumstance that after all our history was regarded by us and others as a history of sin. Right. So in order to reclaim it, you have to go outside the sort of attitudes that surrounded English perceptions of Australia at the time. You know, you could understand, I think, uh, if you look at the history of, of colonized people, and you read, for, instance, for example, the opening pages of James's The Black Jacobins, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and where he describes the practices of the white man in the slave plantations of the Caribbean, for example, you know, filling a slave with gunpowder and setting fire to him and having him blow up. Yeah. Uh, the, the separation of families, mm -hmm. the abuse, of, et cetera. W when you look at that history uh, as a member of that, of that class of people, that race, you know, you've, you're filled with rage. Mm -hmm. And one of the impulses then is to say, A, I have to tell the story as no one has told it from their point of view. We must tell our story. But the next stage, of course, is this, what we've been calling a kind of separatist thing. Uh, and Along with that goes a perpetuation of blame and hostility. In other words, trying to get restitution for a past that, in a certain sense, once you've recovered it in history, you can't, you can't rewrite the past. You, you, no, the you most can't. you can do is to tell the story. Yep. So the question then uh, you know, proposes itself is, how do you get out of that, particularly in situations that are aggravated by the fact that, the, that your people are still the dispossessed of the earth. I don't think case. you can get no, out. No, but that's the point. You can't. You can't. But the one thing you can do is somehow not to perpetuate the ideology of separation between peoples. For this, the contemporary university seems ideally suited. I see it as an almost utopian space where teachers and students alike can develop a critical attitude and break down barriers between areas of experience in the search for knowledge. I've been teaching at Columbia for 30 years now, and despite its sometimes alienating size and presence, 
the freedom to do this kind of work has never been lacking. plays about social problems, in other words, they're deeply serious in many ways. Um, what one has to be also aware of is that uh, Shaw really was a visionary. Right? And for him, the drama was, to use a phrase from uh, Arthur I teach Dantos, English, French, and American literature in lectures and seminars. Writers from the traditional canon, like George Bernard Shaw, Jane Austen, Herman Melville, and Charles Dickens. My aim is to raise questions about how these authors should be read, in what historical context, and what their works disclose or conceal about the geographical and social world. Although I don't always teach what I write about, when I do, I've learned a tremendous amount from the teaching process itself, the way it draws you into these works and helps you to formulate your ideas. You do not understand, bottom of 93, cousins, you don't understand the Salvation Army. It is the army of joy, of love, the one author I've always taught, and even wrote my first book about, is Joseph Conrad. The affinity I feel for Conrad is that he too was an outsider. He left his native Poland when he was 16 and never returned. And although he lived and wrote his books in England, he never lost his foreignness or his critical perspective on what everyone else took for granted. His most haunting and disquieting work is Heart of Darkness. Published in 1899, it is the story of a journey into Africa at a time when the European powers were carving up the continent for their own profit. Deal table in the middle, plain chairs all round the walls. On one end, a large shining map marked with all the colors of the rainbow. There was a vast amount of red. Good to see at any time because one knows that some real work is done in there. A deuce of a lot of blue, a little green, smears of orange, and on the east coast, a purple patch to show where the jolly pioneers of progress drink the jolly lager beer. However, I wasn't going into any of these. I was going into the yellow, dead in the center. And the river was there, fascinating, deadly, like a snake. Heart of Darkness is the story of a voyage up the river by Marlowe, the narrator, who is in search of a famous colonial official that he's heard about called Kurtz, who is a man who collects ivory and is a great power in, in the heart of this dark continent. And what, what is striking about the novel is that Conrad was extraordinarily critical of the abuses of empire. He saw the predatory nature of the white man, the killing of the natives, the enslavement of the population, the tearing away of treasure from Africa. But what you don't get in Heart of Darkness, despite its extraordinary complexity and irony and its immensely rich narrative, is the sense that Africa is anything more than a continent of inferior people. The blacks in Africa, as Conrad depicts them, are basically savages. The climax of the tale is Kurtz's melodramatic deathbed pronouncement, the horror, the horror, a deliberately enigmatic phrase that underscores Africa's menacing incomprehensibility to Europeans. problem with Heart of Darkness from the point of view of a contemporary African reading this novel, that despite its power, despite the immense criticism 
of imperialism as Conrad describes it in this novel, one has no sense of the black Africans except as dehumanized creatures who are victimized, it's true, by the white man, but their destiny is to remain, as Conrad saw and other Europeans at the time saw, inferior creatures. The celebrated Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe once said that the trouble with Heart of Darkness and White shouldn't be read as a classic, is that it really is a dehumanizing portrait of the native. And to a certain degree, this is absolutely true. Conrad can only conceive of the native, even as he's criticizing the white man for his predatory attitude, for his schemes of conquest and profit. For Conrad, like all Europeans at the time, the black man was designed to be inferior, to be secondary, to remain within the orbit of Europe and the West. I was tired of reading and hearing about Africans being persecuted and oppressed in Africa, in the Middle Passage, in the USA, and all over the Caribbean. I made up my mind that I would write a book in which Africans or people of African descent, instead of constantly being the object of other people's exploitation and ferocity, would themselves be taking action on a grand scale and shaping people to their own needs. These aren't my words. They're the words of the Caribbean historian and activist C.L.R. James in the foreword to his classic narrative of emancipation, The Black Jacobins. This book tells the story of Toussaint Louverture, who in 1791 led the slave revolt of San Domingo against the French plantation owners, which finally resulted in the establishment of the independent republic of Haiti. In the book, James portrays the natives as animated by the ideals of liberty and justice, whereas in Conrad, Africans are present only as the dehumanized creatures of European will. This process, which I and others have called writing back, was crucial to the story of empire that I wanted to tell. C.L.R. James was one of the first writers from the colonized world to use the discourse and weapons of scholarship and criticism once reserved exclusively for the European, as a resistance to European empire. C.L.R. James had a profound influence on a whole generation of non-Western, anti-imperialist writers, scholars, and activists, one of whom, in turn, has had an equally profound effect on my own work. I dedicated my book to Dr. Iqbal Ahmad. An Indian Muslim, now a Pakistani citizen, Iqbal is a learned historian and imaginative analyst of the Muslim and Western worlds. I mean, that's, I think Unlike most scholars, however, that, he's also been a political activist, I mean, serving for some years with the FLN in Algeria, even though, like C.L.R. James, Iqbal grew up in the British Empire. I'm sort of reminded of the, again, over, over again and again, of the title of his book on cricket. Beyond the Boundary. Beyond the Boundary. Right. And I'm sort of have been thinking of it of the fact that one thing in which the third world peoples of the British Empire particularly ended up competing with Britain on was cricket. Right. And this was one game in which they kept beating England in cricket. Right. And I have often wondered if our thirst for beating or excelling in cricket did not have to do with the fact that the British set boundaries for us and the game made it permissible to hit beyond the boundaries. Yeah, right. I think that was working on James when Oh, he I think so. And I think, I mean, you know, that within, the, I mean, it really proves the point that within a culture, even though you're, you're supposed to respect the boundaries, right? But that the very nature of culture in a certain sense, it's allows to you to develop, to, to open up. Right, to go beyond. And it was the <clears throat> character of imperialism, not of culture, you see. It was the character of imperialism to shut things down and say, yeah. well, if you're a wog or a babu, you know, or a nigger, that's where you belong. And if, you're, if we're a mic man, that's where you belong. But the genius with which James transformed the game into really taking it, in a certain sense, into their territory. Or the genius with which the people of the empire transformed the right, game exactly. in many ways. Exactly. I mean, I, I met, I met C.L.R. James once. You have? Uh, I, I met him once, yeah. He was, he was quite an old man at the time. Was he, I think a when, year or two before. He had he had a London. I went to see him. 
And during the whole time I saw him, he was wa watching a cricket, cricket match at the, on television. He had a blanket, it was in the middle of July, it was quite hot, and he had a blanket across his knees. And he was talking to me, you know, part of the time, and the other part of the time he's watching the cricket match with the sound turned off. So it was, it was quite, quite remarkable that he was able to go clearly between one and the other. He was in his late 80s at the time. And every so often he'd ask me a very pointed question. He would say to me, for instance, what do you think about Kipling? And I'd say, well, Kipling was a, was a, it was a complete shit uh, politically. But he was a, he was a great writer. <laughs> he, said, uh, you know, uh, he said, I completely agree with you. And the same question came up about uh, music, about Western music. But you know, on Kipling, he was also reflecting childhood memories. Memories, so of were course. All brought up on we were all brought up on Kipling. Exactly. But I mean, the point is, he didn't deny it. Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best you breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new court sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Take up the white man's burden, have done with childish days. The lightly proffered laurel, the easy ungrudged praise, comes now to search your manhood through all the thankless years. Cold edge with dear bought wisdom, the judgment of your peers. British were in India for over 300 years. India was the greatest, the most durable and profitable of all British colonial possessions. And as such, it acquired an increasingly influential role in British life, not just in politics and trade, but also in works of the imagination. The richness, the glamour, the excitement of the British experience in India was most brilliantly conveyed by the writer Rudyard Kipling. Kipling not only wrote about India, he was of it. He was born there in 1865 and early in his career worked as a journalist in the Punjab. His travels through the country provided him with much of the raw material for his first short stories. But for me, the novel Kim is the greatest of all of Kipling's many writings about India. Kimmel O'Hara is an orphaned white boy who attaches himself to a saintly old Tibetan monk. As they wander through the country looking for the river of life, Kim is enlisted in the British Secret Service, the great game, and foils the plot by troublemaking Russian spies. At one point, Kim and his guru meet an old soldier who lives next to the Grand Trunk Road. The Great Road is the backbone of all Hind. For the most part, the old soldier says, it is shaded as here with four lines of trees. The middle road, all hard, takes the quick traffic. In the days before rail carriages, the sahibs traveled up and down here in hundreds. Now there are only country carts and such like. Left and right is the rougher road for the heavy carts, grain and cotton and timber, fodder, lime and hides. A man goes in safety here, for at every few costs is a police station. The police are thieves and extortioners. I myself, says the old soldier, would patrol it with cavalry, young recruits under a strong captain. All castes and kinds of men move here. Look, Brahmins and Chumars, bankers and tinkers, barbers and bunyas, pilgrims and potters, all the world going and coming. It is to me as a river from which I am withdrawn, like a log after a flood. And immediately after, Kipling adds, and truly the Grand Trunk Road, which runs north-south, is a wonderful spectacle. It runs straight, bearing without crowding India's traffic for 1,500 miles, such a river of life as nowhere else exists in the world. And the Trunk Road symbolizes for Kipling not just the actual Trunk Road, but the way in which if an Englishman were to walk through India, the way Kipling did, 
you could see the entire country, this immense subcontinent with its hundreds of millions of people displaying themselves, presenting themselves as if to the eye of the European, who was there, obviously, as the old soldier testifies, to hold everything in order. Now, this book, Kim, was published in 1901 at roughly the same time as Conrad's Heart of Darkness. But the difference between the two of them is, of course, that Heart of Darkness is about a dark continent, which is incomprehensible, which is mysterious. For Kipling, India is a place that displays itself, that is there for the Englishman, and one can enjoy it. But what neither Conrad nor Kipling could imagine was that these places were places where natives not only lived, but where natives wanted their independence. And the irony of this passage, and indeed of the whole novel, Kim, is that Kipling seems to have shut himself off, turned away from what was there to be seen, namely the existence of Indian nationalism. The Indian Congress Party, which was the party that brought Nehru and Gandhi to the fore in the period after World War I, was already founded when Kim was written. And there's a sense in which you have Kipling presenting India like a grand daydream, a place where the English could not only enjoy themselves, but stay indefinitely. I went to an English colonial school called Victoria College in Egypt. Looking back at it now, it too seems like part of the grand daydream that Kipling describes in Kim. Here we were, a large gaggle of Arab schoolboys, dressed improbably in blazers and flannels, studying under British masters who taught us about King Alfred, and Shakespeare, and the Glorious Revolution. And all the while, none of us paid much attention to the Arab world, or even to the imperial system of which we were a part. What India was for the British, Algeria was for the French. Algeria was not just a colonial possession. It was made a department of France. It is from this Algeria that one of the most celebrated and honored modern French writers, Albert Camus, emerged. is shot. He doesn't have a name. He doesn't have any parents. He doesn't seem to have any occupation. He just dies. He's shot by a Frenchman, Merceau, who is the hero of Albert Camus' most famous novel, L'Etranger. And so it is in the fiction of Albert Camus that one finds Algeria simply a backdrop, and the Algerians who are the natives of the place are seen as the background. What really matters is the consciousness of the hero, who is always French. The fact is, of course, that the French came to North Africa, to Algeria, in 1830, and they stayed there until 1962, when Algeria was liberated. Camus is part of the struggle. By the time he started to write, the Algerian resistance was very hot, and throughout his life, Camus always opposed the Algerian demands for independence. And therefore, to understand Camus, one has to understand him as part of the contest between France as an imperial power and the North African, Arab, and Berber Muslims 
who were opposed to French colonization and fought bitterly in the War of Liberation. Ironically, most of the readers of Camus see him, uh, the European readers, see him as a European writer in the tradition of Stendhal and uh, Constant. Cyril Connolly, for example, in the preface to the English translation of the novel, writes as follows. What is an Algerian? He's not a French colonial, but a citizen of France, domiciled in North Africa, a man of the Mediterranean. For him, there's no 18th century, no Baroque, no Renaissance, no Crusades or troubadours in the past of the Barbary Coast. Nothing but the Roman Empire, decaying dynasties of Turk and Moor, the fresh conquest, and the imposition of the laws and commerce of the Third Republic on the ruins of Islam. It is from a sultry and African corner of Latin civilization that L'Etranger emerges. But to read Camus only in this way is really, I think, to misread him, because Camus is part of the French struggle against the Algerian natives. And in order, I think, fully to read him and to understand and appreciate the background from which his work in French derives, one must remember that there is another side. There has not yet been a single Frenchman indicted before a French court of justice for the murder of an Algerian. In Indochina, in Madagascar, or in the other colonies, the native has always known that he need expect nothing from the other side. The settler's work is to make even dreams of liberty impossible for the native. The native's work is to imagine all possible methods for destroying the settler. Those are words written by Franz Fanon who was born in the French colonial possession of Martinique in 1925. He was educated as a doctor, he became a psychiatrist, and in the 1950s he went to Algeria and joined the FLN, which is the main resistance group fighting the French, and he died in 1961 of leukemia. Fanon became the most eloquent and famous spokesman for the Algerian Revolution, but he also spoke for natives everywhere. He spoke for the natives of Africa, of the Caribbean, and of all of Asia in their struggle against the white imperialists. When Fano was working as a psychiatrist in a French hospital, he started treating victims of French torture. He also started treating the torturers. And there is that appendix in Wretched of the Earth, which sort of half, half tells that story. Hearing the stories, examining the psyche of the torturer and the tortured, transformed him as an individual. I have no idea, and I asked Fanon twice, did you do any good to your patients? Mm. He said, je ne sais pas. I have no idea, I don't know. I said, then what happened? He said, ça me transformed me. It transformed me. Oh, because what he discovered in that relationship were three or four things. Mm. One was, how injurious the relationship of domination is, both to the dominator and to, be, to the dominated, to the victim and the victimizer. The second thing he understood, and powerfully, was that race, he hadn't come to the full realization of sex about it, although he shows signs of seeing it in l'année cinquième de la Révolution algérienne, mm. 
But he understood that race plays a very important role in separating people artificially. And thirdly, he realized, he learned this from the Algerian victims, that when the victim stands on his feet and fights back, he is not a victim anymore. The liberation of Algeria in 1962 came almost at the end of a whole movement right across Africa and Asia, through which nationalist parties and leaders won independence from Britain and France. Some years ago, we made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. We must realize that from now on we are no more a colonial but a free and independent people. If you want to understand one another, the best thing is to talk together, to exchange views. This is my belief. We must also learn how to forgive one another. We are not angels, we are human beings. We want you to cooperate with us so that we can work together to make Canaan a suitable place for human beings to live in. change blowing through the Belgian Congo and down comes the Belgian flag in Leopoldville, a few days in fact in advance of independence. Elected as Prime Minister of the new Congo Republic, Mr. Patrice Lumumba receives congratulations from members of both Houses of Parliament. In the Arab world, the struggle for independence was personified by Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser. I came to political awareness of myself as an Arab largely because of what he represented, particularly during the Suez Crisis when he stood up to Britain, France and Israel. Nasser was a tragic figure. He symbolized on the one hand the pride and inspiration of anti-imperial nationalism, and on the other, as Fanon so presciently saw in The Wretched of the Earth, the many abuses and mistakes that nationalism gave rise to after its successful and often violent struggle against the empire. Fanon's real strength lies not in his depiction of violence or resistance for that matter. It lies in his understanding of nationalism and the pitfalls of national consciousness. Mm. And the chapter that he has written on what is wrong with national consciousness and what kind of a state this kind of national consciousness produces says a lot about what we have become in Algeria. And elsewhere. Or elsewhere. And elsewhere. You know, those essays that you wrote for Arab Studies Quarterly, mm. a magazine which I once used to edit. But you found on, it. Found it. Uh, on the pathology of power is, I think, quite unique, really, uh, although I would have wished you to have developed them more. But this phenomenon, which really now, again, in a certain sense, justifies the internationalism of Fanon, because it's everywhere. It's not just Algeria. I mean, you have Algeria, you have the various Arab states with their various, as you describe them, Praetorian or fascist or whatever, structures and so on. The absence of criticism from within, the way in which the state 
or political society absorbs civil society. The way in which, in the Arab countries, there, there is no press to speak of. I mean, the press is essentially a reflection of the ruler's comings and goings, and his alliances and enmities of the day. This panorama all across the third world, in the countries which fought for independence, suggests, therefore, the extent to which nationalism just went wrong. This is CNN. Had to, had to prepare Marlon Fitzwater, man. We're dealing with press things and so forth, because we clearly had to prepare the president. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When the Gulf War broke out in January of 1991, I'd almost finished working on my book. But as an Arab and an American who lived in both worlds, I found all this particularly troubling, not least because the confrontation appeared so total, so globally all-encompassing, that there was no way of not being involved. There's tremendous lightning in the sky, lightning like a pick, Bernie. I have a sense, Peter, that uh, people are shooting towards the sky, and they are not aware or cannot see what they're shooting at. This is extraordinary. I knew that Iraq's occupation of Kuwait was illegal, and that Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator, a devalued Nasser. I had no illusions, however, that America, the self-appointed champion of the West and the last superpower, was doing anything more than acting in her own interests to protect oil supplies. Moreover, American intervention prevented any Arab solution to the Iraqi occupation. There had been other invasions in the contemporary drama of the West's relationship with the Middle East. Turkey had invaded Cyprus, Israel had invaded Lebanon and was in military occupation of the Golan Heights, East Jerusalem, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. All of them had been condemned by the West, but none provoked the all-out response we witnessed in Desert Storm. The war made me look again at what I had written. Here was a new chapter of the imperial story, with the United States now at the center of the world stage, instead of France and Britain. And as culture in the form of various narratives of Western ascendancy had shaped the 19th century imperial dynamic, so it was the media that now played the same role. For the American public, this was the most covered and the least reported war in history. The images that were beamed across the world courtesy of the networks and CNN were not only misleading about the truly messy reality out there, but they encouraged a taste for the surgical cleanness of electronic warfare. These uh, television images of the Gulf War summarize the quality of coverage of this war. The triumphalist celebrations of the victors, the embodiment of the West, the clean warriors with a just cause, Americans going forth to fight against, on the other side, uh, Arabs, indiscriminate, huge numbers of people without faces, known as camel jockeys, towel heads, sheiks, terrorists, and at the head of them, of course, the arch-terrorist, the neo-Hitler, Saddam Hussein. And to get rid of those, after we get rid of the Satan, of the Satan in the White House, the, the hornet nest in the White House. Tonight, I repeat my pledge to you and to all Americans, this will not be another Vietnam. Never again will our armed forces be sent out to do a job with one hand tied behind their back. They...
Wars are fought because peaceful means of resolving crises seem less attractive and because people are impervious to each other's humanity. This is especially true of the Arab Islamic world and the West. For centuries, ignorance, indifference, fear and violence have governed matters between the two. The trouble with these images is that they reduce both sides. And what you have instead is a gulf between the two, the Arabs on the one hand, the West on the other. And this set of caricatures facing each other produces antagonism, it produces hatred, it produces loathing, and above all, violence. The war was a terribly violent thing, principally, of course, for the Arabs. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people made refugees, many, many thousands killed, economies destroyed, ecologies damaged irreparably. And the, and the point then would be that the sense of division is increased. This is a war without a resolution. It cannot be resolved in military or intellectual terms of this sort. And the sense that one has also is the absence of understanding. One doesn't have a sense of people sharing the same history. There's an Arab history on the one hand, there's a Western and American history on the other. And there we have the old imperial formula repeated, divide and rule. And the sense of division, the gulf between people, reduces each side to a sense of us and the other them. Us versus them. This is a continuation of the old imperial story with both sides now trapped in narratives of their own making. Ever since I can remember, I have felt that I belong to more than one world. And yet, in the late 20th century, the imperial cycle of the last century in some way replicates itself. Although today there are really no big empty spaces, no expanding frontiers, no exciting new settlements to establish. We live in one global environment. Anyone with even a vague consciousness of this whole is alarmed at how such remorselessly selfish and narrow interests, patriotism, chauvinism, ethnic, religious, and racial hatreds, can in fact lead to mass destructiveness. The world simply cannot afford this many more times. No one today is purely one thing. Labels like Indian or woman or Muslim or American are no more than starting points. Imperialism consolidated the mixture of cultures and identities on a global scale. But its worst and most paradoxical gift was to allow people to believe that they were only, mainly, exclusively white or black or Western, or Oriental. It is more rewarding and more difficult to think about others than only about us. But this also means not trying to rule others, and above all, not constantly reiterating how our culture or country is number one.